This is a pot-pot boat or a putt-putt boat, and I've seen various different explanations online for how it works. So I thought, you know, the only way to know for sure is to build a transparent version. This channel is rapidly becoming the transparent version of things channel. But anyway, let's have a look at the regular pop pop boat first. You've got this little tank here with two pipes coming out the back. And if you follow those pipes, they come out at the back of the boat under the level of the water. The first thing you have to do is fill the tank and the pipes with water. You then need to light a fire under the tank. In this case, we're using a mini tea light candle. Very quickly, the pop pop boat starts to make this popping sound and it whizzes around in the water. Now, according to the common explanation, the tank remains full of water until it reaches boiling point. And then you get this sudden release of steam, which forces the water down the tubes. As that steam continues to expand, that follows the water down the tube. The tubes are much cooler than the tank, so the steam condenses back into water. That reduces the pressure inside the tank, and so the water is sucked back into the tank. All the steam condenses, and you're once again left with a full tank of water. Once back inside the hot tank, boiling happens again, and the whole cycle continues. But with the glass version of the pop pop boat, we should be able to see if that's actually what's going on. The first thing you notice actually is that it's quite hard to fully fill the tank with water with no air trapped inside there. Look, if I don't make any effort to tilt the boat in funny ways to remove air bubbles, this is how much water you get in the tank. Most of it's actually air. It is possible to get rid of almost all the air by tipping the boat upside down whilst you're squeezing water in until you essentially flush the whole system with water. But you don't do that with the metal pop pop boat. So my assumption is actually there's probably a big bubble of air inside the metal pop pop boat during operation. The first thing you notice as the tank starts to heat up is that this little pocket of air gets bigger and bigger. Thanks, by the way, to Lee Mulholland and the scientific glass blowing team at the University of Southampton for making this boat. So I imagine two things are happening here. That little bubble of air is expanding because air expands as temperature increases, but also some water vapor is being created, even at these temperatures below the boiling point of water. The gas cavity continues to expand until it reaches these two tubes. And actually, it continues to expand beyond that down into the tubes. But you'll notice there's a little reservoir of water still in the tank. And then at some point, the water in the tube starts to oscillate back and forth inside the tube. By the way, the batteries are only there because the boat was too heavy at the front. Though I do appreciate it looks like a really dodgy perpetual motion machine with not so well hidden batteries, but I promise they're only there for the weight. Perhaps the oscillations would occur in different places in the tube, depending on how full the tank was to begin with. Here's a test where I don't make any attempt to fill up the tank. I just make sure the two tubes are full. Look, there's only a bit of water in there. In this setup, once the gas starts to expand, it fills the two tubes almost entirely. There is still a tiny bit of water left in the tank, which is slowly going down as more and more of it vaporizes. But eventually you do seem to get some oscillation right at the very exit of the exhaust pipes. And that does seem to be enough to get the thing moving. But to go back to the full tank test, well, the oscillations still happen inside the tubes, not in and out of the tank. So at least with this version of the pop pop boat, that's where the action is. On the surface, this seems quite different to the description you tend to see online, where the tank fills up with water, then fills up with steam, then fills up with water. But although the reality looks quite different, I believe the method of operation is very similar. The best way to think about it, and actually it's not often described in this way, is in terms of resonance. This packet of gas inside the tank and the tubes is elastic. If you squeeze it, it will push back. And so if you do it in the right way, it will oscillate. It will resonate at its natural frequency. A bit like the air inside this glass syringe. Boyoing. But you'll notice that the air resonating inside this glass syringe is very damped. The oscillations die away very quickly. So we need some kind of external energy source to keep that oscillation going. And of course, that energy is supplied by the candle. But how exactly? 
Well, when you have something oscillating with simple harmonic motion and you want to increase the amplitude or at least stop the amplitude going down because of damping, then obviously the force that you apply needs to be applied with the same frequency. Like you need to push and pull at the same frequency, but you also need to worry about the timing. Like if you push when the gas is pulling and you pull when the gas is pushing, that's not going to work. Whenever the gas is expanding, the engine needs to be applying an expanding force. And whenever the gas is contracting, the engine needs to be applying a contracting force. In technical language, that means that the force applied is a quarter of a wavelength out of phase with the displacement of the oscillator. But where does this force come from? Well, it comes from a temperature difference. And that makes sense, like if you just uniformly heated up the gas and water inside the engine, well, some things will expand and the temperature will change, but it won't oscillate. For it to oscillate, you need some exchange between hot and cold regions. That's how any heat engine works. For example, the Stirling engine that I use in my video explaining entropy, link in the card in the description. In this case, as the gas expands into the tubes, well, the tubes are much colder. And when a gas gets colder, the pressure goes down especially if it's water vapor, because some of that steam will condense back into liquid water, drastically reducing the pressure. But of course, as the gas contracts, it ends up back inside the tank where it's hotter. As the gas heats up, the pressure goes up, and so it expands back into the pipes, and that cycle continues. At this point, you may have worked out that a pop-pop boat doesn't need two pipes. It will work just fine with a single pipe, but having two makes it a lot easier to fill. You squeeze water into one pipe and it expels air out of the other. With the glass pop-pop boat, you don't get the popping sound. That's because with the metal boat, you have this plate of metal on top and as the pressure goes up and down, that metal plate flexes up and down, causing a popping sound. But there's nothing really flexible about the glass boat, so you don't get the popping sound. The final thing we need to explain is, like, how is it that water going in and out of the exhaust tubes at the back leads to propulsion? Because it's not obvious. Like, intuitively, it's a reciprocating motion. Everything that happens in one direction then immediately happens in reverse. So surely the boat should just go back and forth on the spot and not actually travel anywhere. Well, it's actually reasonably common for a reciprocating mechanism to lead to non-reciprocating motion. Take, for example, the Bristlebot. The Bristlebot works by vibrating the head of a toothbrush up and down. And that's obviously reciprocating motion, but it leads to forward progress of the bristle bot. If I slowly press down on the head of this toothbrush, it leans forwards on the bristles. And if I slowly let go, it leans back up again. And so that reciprocal motion leads to no change in position. But if you do it quickly, well, first of all, I press down and that causes the bristle bot to lean forwards. And if I quickly release, well, the bristle bot springs up and the bristles slide forward. And so with each cycle, the bristle bot moves forward. So how does the reciprocating mechanism in the pop-pop boat lead to forward motion? Well, one suggestion is that as the jet of water leaves the exhaust, it's collimated. It's all moving in the same direction. And because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, that causes the boat to move forward. Whereas when the water is drawn back into the pipes, it's drawn in from all directions. So the reverse motion of the boat is weaker, but actually that argument doesn't stand because all we really care about is the momentum of the water that interacts with the boat. That's the water inside the tube. And it's the same mass of water going forwards as going backwards. The real answer is that after the expulsion phase, the boat can continue to glide forward with the new momentum that it has. Whereas when the water is sucked into the boat, yes, there is an opposite reaction force that pulls the boat back, but at the end of the suction phase, there's essentially a collision. The water slows down inside the tubes because it's colliding with the air inside the tubes, and the air is enclosed within the entire boat system. So 
In other words, the reason the water that's being sucked in slows down is because it's colliding with the boat and it's imparting momentum on the boat, which exactly cancels out the reverse momentum as it was being sucked in. In summary, during the expulsion phase, there's no cancellation of the momentum being imparted by the expelled water, but during the suction phase, there is a cancellation. Altogether, that leads to a net forward motion of the boat. Anchor sent me this portable power station to do a quick review at the end of one of my videos. They are paying me, it's important that you know that, but let's just get into the details. It's the Anchor 521 and it's got 256 watt hours of power, so it's an absolute beast. It'll give you 200 watts of power from the mains adapter. It's UK for me, but if you bought it in America, obviously it'd be American. If you bought it in the EU, it would be EU. It also has the car charger, that'll do 200 watts as well. It's got fast charge charging USB ports and it's got a fancy light as well. My laptop maxes out just over 100 watts if I'm using it and charging it at the same time so it can easily handle that. It can also handle small appliances like a mini fridge if you're going to take that on holiday or you can you know pump up your pool with an electric pump. In terms of capacity you can charge your iPhone 12 20 times, my beefy laptop maybe three times. It's saying 3.7 hours to a full charge from 16%, that's pretty much in line with what I've experienced, but it will get you up to 80% much quicker than that in about an hour and a half from no charge. It uses lithium ion phosphate technology which is the longest lasting lithium technology on the market. You can charge cycle this thing 3000 times and you'll still have 80% of charge left, which is six times better than standard lithium ion technology. It comes with its own charger, obviously, but because it's got a USB-C port for charging your devices, you can actually do it in reverse. You can charge the power station from USB-C as a backup option. I'm often in the market for this kind of power pack, and as you can see, Anker is the name that I look out for. And that's not just me, Anker is recognized as the world's number one mobile charging brand. They've been in the business for 10 years. They've sold over 200 million products in 146 countries. Next time you go on a camping trip or a weekend away, think about taking one of these things. And when you're not camping, keep it in your home in case of a blackout. The link to buy the Anker 521 portable power station is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, think about watching this video next. It's the one the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy the most.